It's good to be here. Amen. We have God's word set before us and may we look in it for guidance and direction to our everyday lives. And I'm very confident, uh, sure that God has a message for us today in his word. That message will come from Ezra, the third chapter, Ezra, chapter number three, as we'll be continuing our series, returning to worship. As every area of society around us begins to return from the captivity caused by the coronavirus, it is also time for the Lord's churches to return. You know, people are returning to everything else in life, whether that be work or restaurants or the gas station, the store, vacation, um, the beauty parlor, whatever it may be, uh, society is returning. But I think the most essential, the most important of a return should be to the Lord's local church. It is time. Churches are essential in my biblical perspective. The most essential Your spiritual health is the most essential. It is the most important thing in your life. You wake up and before all else is my spiritual health. What can I do today to bring God glory? How can I get closer to the Lord today? That is essential in our life. Our spiritual hunger. Our spiritual thirst. Your spiritual state and growth should be the top priority in your life it is the most important and that should reflect itself in your worship week to week well it was time for the nation of Israel to return to worship after 70 years of captivity and it is time for Bethel to return to worship after a time of captivity caused by the coronavirus So as returning and reopening is a theme across the country, I again felt it appropriate to preach on this and see a biblical example of a return in Scripture. In the book of Ezra, God has given us that wonderful historic example of a return. Of a return. I think we're going to see even more evidences of how beautiful this example is in Ezra chapter. So, the book of Ezra. Due to Israel's sin and their disobedience to God, they have been in captivity for 70 years to Babylon. They did not let the land rest every Sabbath year if they should for 490 years. So 70 years they were in captivity. Their land lay desolate. Their temple lay burned. They were outside of their religious life, outside of temple worship for this time as they were in captivity in Babylon. But then on October 29th, 539 B.C., King Cyrus of Persia comes into Babylon, defeats Babylon. The king Belshazzar has him killed. King Cyrus takes over uh, the nation of Babylon and thus takes over the people of Israel. After he has taken that over, he issues a decree to return. God stirred his heart. He likely saw in Scripture the prophecy. Jeremiah prophesied, so did Isaiah that Cyrus. And Isaiah prophesied that Cyrus would cause the people to return and rebuild the temple. So he did just that. He issued a decree in verses 1 uh, through 4 to return to Jerusalem, to rebuild the temple, to return to worship. And that's where we find ourselves in the book of Ezra. And we again, what's the real life application? What are we trying to get out of this study? What are we trying to get out of this book? Well, these principles can be applied to returning to rebuilding the Christian life after a time of spiritual desolation. Listen, to rebuilding the Christian life after a time of maybe being away from Scripture, from prayer, from church, a time of sin in your life. It's Uh, principles can be applied to rebuilding. Rebuilding and restoring. We'll go through the whole chapter 3 today. We won't read it all at first. We'll read it throughout as we go through the points. And The first point I want you to see is the gathering. Is the gathering in verse number 1. Look here. And when the seventh month was come, and the children of Israel were in the cities... The people 
gathered themselves together as one man to Jerusalem. They had returned. They had went to their own cities. And it was time to gather again. Amen. It was time for them to gather together in person in the city of Jerusalem. Returning to worship remains returning to gathering. It was needed for them as they returned from captivity, as they returned from worship. It was important to them. They desired to gather together and to worship the God of their deliverance. Above anything else, they wanted to return to worship in the temple in Jerusalem. And I think we ought to have that same mindset. That same desire, amen? To want to gather together. And to want to worship the Lord. As His people. To be in God's house with God's people, worshiping Him above anything and everything else. You know, there's something funny in life, and it proves to be true. We always find a way to do what we want to do. Amen? If there's something we really want and we really desire, listen, there will be no excuses. There will be a way and you will find it and you will do that thing that you want to do. Should not our first priority, as I've already said, be to worship the Lord assembled together. And if you truly want to do that, you will find a way to do that. Amen. There can be a lot of excuses. But the truth is, people will find a way to do what they want to do one way or the other. You couldn't stop these Israelite people from gathering together in Jerusalem to worship the Lord. You would not stop them. They were going to gather. And it says they did. They gathered themselves together as one man. Listen, the physical gathering of God's people is important. It is needed for us. Don't ever put that out. It is needed for your spiritual health. For the sweet fellowship with each other that as Christians we require. Fellowship is not something to be looked at as optional, as something along the side. It has to be looked at as essential. God sees it that way. And it is essential for us to gather together. God made it that way. God intended it to be that way. God has instructed us to assemble. And let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another, and so much the more, as you see the day approaching. We see the importance of fellowship of God just within the Trinity. Amen? God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit and the fellowship, perfect fellowship that they had. Read the first chapter of John. Fellowship, gathering is important. It is needed. It is necessary. There are many things you cannot do if you are not gathered physically. There is a vast difference from gathering physically and gathering virtually. I've heard the arguments, it is the same. No, it's not the same. It's not. It doesn't have the same effect. With the physical gathering of God's people, there is fellowship. There is encouragement. There is intimacy. There is edification. 
There's a commitment, is there not? There's a purpose when you gather here. There's a purpose and a commitment and a dedication when you gather together in God's house. There's an importance and it is a example. It is a manifestation that you have set everything else aside in your life to come and worship God. It's what it is. The idea of isolation, only virtual communication and only indirect involvement with people is not God's intentions for us or for His people. God said that it was not good. For what? Man to be alone. God desires His people to gather, to fellowship, to have deep meaningful relationships with one another. The idea of separation from people, from relationships, and from intimacy with people is not God's idea. It is God's idea of fellowship and intimacy with His people. Notice not only that they gather together, but they gather together as what? One man to Jerusalem. They gather together in unity. They gather together with one mind, with one purpose, with one heart. And agreeance. They weren't separated into groups. They weren't separated into philosophies and the teams of people, but came together as a unit working together. Psalm 133, 1. Behold how good and pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. So the first thing we can see of returning to worship in the book of Ezra is that they gathered together as one man. Gathering is important. It is needed for Bethel. Number two, offering. Offering, verses two through seven. Then stood up Jeshua, the son of Josadak, and his brethren, the priest, and Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, and his brethren, and Builded the altar of the God of Israel to offer burnt offerings thereon, as it is written in the law of Moses, the man of God. There's a picture of the burnt offering. And they set the altar upon his bases, for fear was upon them because of the people of those countries. And they offered burnt offerings thereon unto the Lord, even burnt offerings morning and evening. They kept also the Feast of Tabernacles, as it is written, and offered the daily burnt offerings by number, according to the custom, as the duty of every day required. And afterward offered the continual burnt offering, both of the new moons and of all the set feasts of the Lord that were consecrated, and of every one that willingly offered a free will offering unto the Lord. From the first day of the seventh month began they to offer burnt offerings unto the Lord. The very first day they gathered together. But the foundation of the temple of the Lord was not yet laid. They gave money also unto the masons, and to the carpenters, and meat, and drink, and oil, unto them of Zidon, and to them of Tyre, to bring cedar trees from Lebanon to the Sea of Joppa, according to the grant that they had of Cyrus, king of Persia. The second aspect of returning to worship we see is offering. We saw gathering, now we see offering. Returning to worship means returning spiritually. It does not just mean returning physically, but you need to spiritually return as well. We see the leaders that initiated this return, Joshua, Zerubbabel, and their colleagues, they wanted the people of Israel to restore the sacrifices to God. They initiated this building of the, of the altar and the restoring of the burnt offering and sacrifices to God. God's leaders need to lead the way in returning to worship. There needs to be leadership. There needs to be people stand up and lead people back to where they need to be. Zerubbabel. Joshua and their colleagues did this in our text. 
the altar of burnt offerings. That's what all really this whole text is about in verses two through seven. Uh, we saw a picture of it there. The whole animal would be burned on an altar that would look very much like that. And what this purpose was, what it was used for, was not only for consecration, saying we have set God aside as most important, but as all offerings, it acknowledged that there was sin that needed to be atoned for, okay? We got that? That there was a spiritual restoration needed. There was a spiritual need of the people before they could even start building the temple of God. There needed to be a spiritual restoration first. We see that? That is shown by them offering on the burnt offering altar. I love verse 3. And they set the altar upon its basis. For fear was upon them because of the people of those countries. And they offered burnt offerings thereon unto the Lord, even burnt offerings morning and evening. They established the foundation and set the uh, altar upon its bases despite fear. You see that? Despite worry and fear because the danger that surrounded them, they held nothing back. There was some fear, but there was no doubt or hesitation on rebuilding the altar and restoring the temple of God. There was no doubt. There was no hesitation. There was fear, but yet they pursued to restore themselves spiritually. They were courageous. They were determined and set on pleasing the Lord above all. They so desired to please the Lord, the danger did not stop them. There was not even a discussion. They would take the risk if it meant pleasing the Lord. Well, the burnt offerings were fully restored. We see that in all these verses. I mean, every one of them. They didn't start off slow in their sacrifices. They made sure they offered every proper burnt offering. Offerings in the morning, in the evening, in the Feast of Tabernacles, every burnt offering that was required each day. Continual burnt offerings. Burnt offerings for the new moons. Burnt offerings for the holy assemblies. Voluntary burnt offerings. But we must remember these burnt offerings were not just restored for ceremonial purposes. They they weren't just restored for the sake of restoring them. It was done for a spiritual purpose. They understood the spiritual significance of their offerings. They understood their need for forgiveness and restoration to God. Oh, how sweet the smell of those sacrifices must have been in the nostrils of God. And all this started the very first day they gathered together. Verse 6, from the first day of the seventh month. And verse 1 says, when the seventh month was come. See that? very first day they gathered together, they restored the altar. They got restored spiritually. They were zealously pursuing the Lord. Her heart was set on spiritual things, set on things of God. And notice, they did not wait until the foundation of the temple was laid to start offering sacrifices. They did not say, okay, let's wait, let's make sure the temple's built, make sure we got what we need, then we'll restore the altar and restore sacrifices. This might not be the right time, let's put it off. No, they said it does not matter, we need to restore spiritually. You see that? You see that there? So let's Really, really apply it to our lives today. These returning people were concerned about spiritual things first and foremost. You see, the people, they had sinned against God. They were in captivity for 70 years in Babylon. And they had not considered 
the things of God. But now, because of the mercy and grace of God, He was allowing them to return from captivity and return to worship. The people did not take this for granted, but understood their sin and need for reconciliation with the Lord. They understood their spiritual state, and they understood their spiritual need. Listen to this very closely. Spiritual transformation precedes physical transformation. Amen? The sacrifices of God are a broken and contrite heart. God first wants your heart, then He wants service out of a spiritually restored heart. But many reverse these two and it never works. You see, returning to worship is not just about the physical gathering, but it's about your spiritual transformation. You see that? But many want to reverse this. Many just want to try to physical, get the physical things transformed. Well, I'll continue to sit in a pew and I'll continue to sing the hymn and I'll continue to give my monetary offering and I'll continue to do this and I'll continue to do that. And that's all that really matters, right? Make sure I'm doing what the religion tells me to do. But no. No one wants to address the deeper issue of their heart. The blackness of sin that is within the heart and must be dealt with. Because that's difficult and that's hard to see. But it's got to be dealt with first. Many want to try and reconcile their relationship with God purely by those church attendants service, good deeds, but they will never work. Listen, it takes humility, full surrender, complete confession of sin against God to restore yourself spiritually, then to restore your worship. You cannot worship God if you don't worship Him in spirit and in truth, and you're restored spiritually where you need to be. You need to get that. When people try to... And you've seen this. When people try to reconcile with God first by going through the motions of service, it never lasts. Right? Renew commitment to church. Renew commitment to this. Renew commitment to this. Six months done. Right? I'm going to commit to this. It never lasts. It never bears fruit because there was not a spiritual heart change first. We see that? Their heart never changed. They never addressed the real issue. Their issue was not their lack of service, but their inward sin that caused their lack of service. And I'm very confident that when we as a people see our sin and our need for spiritual restoration, our blackness, our depravity, our sin against God, when we truly see that and in humble Nis on our knees, confess it and plead for God to restore us. Then our worship will be restored. But it takes that first. And when you're truly restored spiritually, your service will be truly restored as well. You won't have to be asked. You won't have to be begged. And guess what? You're going to bear fruit. I believe the returning Israelite people understood this. Their burnt offerings were not just empty offerings for the sake of ceremony, but offerings with a repentant and worshipful heart. Get right with God spiritually today. The last thing we see on this point is offerings for the rebuilding of the temple. Remember the people had already given uh, for the uh, restoration. These returning people had, had even already given for the restoration of the temple. But above this, the People gave even more to start the construction of the temple. They gave money for the masons and the carpenters. They gave food and drink and oil to the people of Sidon and Tyre in order to get the cedar wood necessary for the rebuilding of the temple. And what do we see here? Evidence, an illustration of the point I'm making. Are we here? Evidence of the point I'm making. 
we see it displayed beautifully. The people were first restored spiritually, and out of their true spiritual restoration, what came? A physical return and response to their spiritual restoration. We see that? May our actions be a direct result of the spiritual restoration of our heart. May we begin to see the fruits of repentance and spiritual growth here at Bethel. What's the next thing we see? Serving. We'll turn to worship. There's got to be a gathering. There's got to be offering, a spiritual restoration. But there also is serving when you return to worship. Returning to worship again is not just going through motions, but it is serving the Lord. After spiritual restoration comes serving. Verse 8 through 10a. Now in the second year of the coming unto the house of God at Jerusalem, in the second month, began Zerubbabel the son of Shealtiel and Jeshua the son of Josadak and the remnant of their brethren, the priests and the Levites, and all they that were come out of the captivity unto Jerusalem. You see that? All they that came out of the captivity in Jerusalem and appointed the Levites from 20 years old and upward to set forward the work of the house of the Lord. Then stood Jeshua with his sons and his brethren, Cadmiel and his sons, the sons of Judah, together to set forward the workmen in the house of God, the sons of Hinnadad with their sons and their brethren, the Levites. And when the builders laid the foundation of the temple, we see serving. Returning to worship is not just about showing up, about singing a song and hearing a message, but it's also about living our lives for the Lord. Amen? It means serving the Lord in the areas that are needed. The people returned. They gathered. They, all, they made offerings. Spiritual. Physical. Then they started to serve. It wasn't just the leaders. All the people that returned began to work on their building of the temple. It was a group effort. They were all of the same mind and desire to serve the Lord alongside each other. Listen, service to the Lord is not just for one or two people in the church. It is for every one of you. Amen? You have a place of service. You are a part of the body of Christ. Here at Bethel. You have an area... The first thing you have to do to serve in that area is to gather. You've got to be here. Then you've got to be spiritually restored. And then you serve. There are so many areas and ways in which you can serve in and throughout this local church. I can share. So many ways. So I ask, where are you serving? What is your area? Where are you honestly serving the Lord today? Returning to worships is not about returning to pew, it's about returning to service. Where are you serving the Lord? What ways are you currently serving at Bethel? Oh, how much can be done for the kingdom of God if we all came together and played our part and served? I'm serious. But again, we want to put the serving before the spiritual restoration. It doesn't work. You get restored spiritually, then serving is going to happen. Maybe that's why. Levites, 20 years and older, they're put in charge of overseeing the work of the temple. And again, these are God's people, the Levites. They put in charge of all matters that concern the temple. And then it says the builders laid the foundation of the temple. We see the offerings were given, the materials were gathered, the people were serving, all builders were building, and with them all serving together, the foundation of the temple was laid. They did not just have good intentions to rebuild the temple, but they all came together, they all were restored spiritually, they all served, and they got the foundation of the temple laid. It is amazing what we can accomplish for the Lord when our hearts are entirely set on the things of God and not everything else in the world but on God and His local church that you've committed to. Amen? People are gathering. The altar's built. Burnt offerings are being offered. The people are serving. Now the temple foundation has been laid. And what's the natural next step? 
What's the natural next step? Praise. Praise. Look at verse 10b through 13. Praising is the next step. For all He has done, praise God for His goodness and providential care. They set the priest in their apparel with trumpets and the Levites, the son of Asaph, with cymbals to praise the Lord after the ordinance of David, king of Israel. And they sang together by course and praising and giving thanks unto the Lord because He is good, for His mercy endureth forever toward Israel. And all the people shouted with a great shout when they praised the Lord because the foundation of the house of the Lord was laid. But many of the priests and Levites and chief of the fathers were who were ancient men that had seen the first house when the foundation of the house was laid before their eyes wept with a loud voice and many shouted aloud for joy. So that the people could not discern the noise of the shout of joy from the noise of the weeping of the people. For the people shouted with a loud shout and the noise was heard afar off. In addition to gathering, of offering, of service, there was praise. In reality, praise is the natural response of a spiritually restored heart. It will come. It will be there. You see that? Listen. Don't know what your idea of praise is. But praise is not something that is stirred up and started with the piano in a songbook. Amen? Praise is what you bring with you from every day of your life and your week, and then you bring it into the house of God, and then the piano and the songbook aid you in your expression of that praise. Amen? We see that? When the foundation of the temple had been laid, the song leaders of Israel take center stage and they begin to lead the returnees in a praise service. King David, they had appointed these song leaders and they're mentioned specifically here in their text. The song leaders of Israel, they take their positions. The priests stand in their official apparel holding long metallic trumpets. The sons of Asaph with their cymbals as they begin to sing with praise and thanksgiving to the Lord. Here in our text it says they sang together by course. That means they were practiced. That means it was a choral song. It was a choral leading the people. Uh, They began to worship the song leaders. The choral practiced together. And as they began to sing... Everybody else joined in. They began to sing a song and it was because He is good. For His mercy endureth forever toward Israel. They were praising God for His goodness and His mercy for they had brought them back. He had delivered them. He had forgiven their sin. And the temple is being rebuilt. Glory to God. For He is good and His mercy endures forever. And let me tell you something. You can praise that same thing here at Bethel. He is good. And His mercy endureth forever. As the people, they look at this completed temple. The song leaders start to lead in song. Their attorneys break out in praise. Verse 11. They sang, and they sang together by chorus and praise and giving thanks to the Lord. And in that, and all the people shouted with them. Shouted with a great shout. It says they shouted with a great shout as they praised the Lord for His goodness and His mercy. What an exciting moment for the nation of Israel. I'd like to be a part of that praise service, wouldn't you have? Worship services, when all join together in worship and praising the Lord, are incredible. Amen? When a group of people all come together and sing to Him from the joy of their heart, there is nothing else like it. 
I am so looking forward to that day when I stand together with people of every tribe, kindred, and nation. In heaven. A universal worship service. Giving glory and honor to the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. When you return to service, turn to worship, you return to praise. But though it was an incredible and beautiful moment for the nation of Israel, they shouted with joy. Some of the older people began to weep loudly. They remembered the former temple, Solomon's temple. They remembered its grandeur, its size, and its glory. And as they see the foundation, it's not that they weren't thankful. It's not that they weren't excited for the future of Israel. It was they were saddened because the new temple was not going to be what the old temple was. I'm going to apply that to your life because a big truth here. They understood that because of the sin of the nation of Israel, the rebuilt temple would not stand in comparison to the older temple. Sin bears its consequences. You see that? Some wept loudly, remembering the former temple. Others shouted for joy, looking forward to the new temple. But they couldn't be told apart. This worship service is an intense roaring of the congregation. It was so thunderous that the sound of the shouting was heard a long way off. Many should surely wondered what the commotion was going on there in Jerusalem. Let's be honest with the text. What do I see? This praise service. It was emotional. Amen? Was it? Okay. Did you see that? It was heartfelt. It was genuine. It was God-centered. And it was God-honoring. You see that? It was one with such fervency. This shows me that worship services can be fervent, emotional, loud, intense, heartfelt, all while still bringing honor and glory to God. This was a worship service of intensity, of fervency, giving God honor and glory. Led by Solomon. You see that? So there's something else to be pointed out with the weeping of the older returnees. The older people understood the consequences of sin and they saw it before their eyes. Sin has consequences, lasting consequences. Never think that sin will not leave its mark and leave some things in life unrepairable, unable to return, unable to be where it was before. Spiritually, you can be restored. Spiritually, you can be uh, forgiven and restored back to you were before. Amen? Physically, that's not always promised. You see that? It's going to leave consequences in your life, and it's not going to be the same as it was before. In this example, what's the consequence? Rebuilt temple was less than the former temple. But in your life, there are financial consequences. When you make sinful, bad decisions financially, guess what? You'll bear the fruit the rest of your life. When you make bad, sinful decisions with your health, guess what? You're going to suffer the consequences the rest of your life. When you commit sins relationally, relationships, you can destroy relationships and they will never be the same the rest of your life. Mental, you can really mess yourself up mentally and you'll never be mentally restored where you need to be the rest of your life. An emotional, lasting consequence of sin. Sure, all these areas of life can be restored. But rarely are these areas restored to the place they were before. We see that? 
Most times sin bears its consequences. And as things are rebuilt, it is obvious that the process will be difficult and never restored to the former time. Nevertheless, spiritually, you can be fully restored and forgiven before God because the blood of His Son, Jesus Christ, covers all our sins. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins, to cleanse us from our sins, and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Spiritually, you can't. We wrap up this morning. Looking at returning to worship, there is a gathering, there is an offering, there is serving, there is praise. Will you make a commitment to return to worship today? Will you put first things first in your life and make the things of God your first priority? Will you lead your family back to church? Will you be restored spiritually this morning as God works on your heart? As I've said the last three Sundays, in order to return to the Lord, you must first have known the Lord to begin with. Do you know the Lord and does He know you? Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name and in thy name have cast out devils and in thy name done many wonderful works? And then I will profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. There is a work you need to do. It's not first and foremost returning to worship. The work you need to do is believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? That's the work of faith. Put your faith and trust in the Lord. Repent of your sins. Put your faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. And have a personal relationship with Him. Will you be saved this morning? Pray with me. God, we thank You for Your Word. We thank You for its relevance in our lives, even today. God, the examples, the truth that jump off the pages of Your living Word, we thank You for being the living God. With the living Word. The applicable Word. May we not reject it. May we surrender to it. God, as we get, begin to gather again, return to worship. May we be first restored spiritually. Then may we see service. Praise your good. All these things I'm able to pray through the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.